Welcome to Defy These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jiray Ayoub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations in the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. So this is a conversation with Phoebe Wagner. She's the co-editor of the 2017 book Sun Vault, Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation. As you may know by now, I've been sort of promoting this movement, or at least as a as a framework, called Solar Punk. So I had Phoebe Wagner on because I felt like she was one of the best people to talk about this. So of course we asked the question, what is solar punk? And alongside that question, uh, we asked, and what is wrong with modern storytelling about the future? We discussed the, the flaws in many ways of modern storytelling from the patriarchal tropes and the importance of moving beyond them to kind of broader questions around the crisis of imagination. We uh, highlighted the value of community building in stories and in the real world. And we also discussed a kind of more philosophical question, maybe like, is knowledge power? And we tried to answer that in the context of solar punk. So this may at times feel a bit too niche, I hope not. I mean, the entire point of an episode like this one is to kind of bring about a topic that is up until now relatively niche, but to a wider audience. So it really matters to me what you think. Uh, Please let me know by email or on Patreon. And yeah, that's it from me, folks. Uh, Thank you for listening and take care. My name is Phoebe Wagner and my pronouns are she, her. I currently am a settler on Susquehannock land in so-called Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and I'm a writer, editor, and academic. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for having this chat with me. Um, you've co-edited this book, you know, that, that's how I, I got to reading some of your stuff. And this book is called uh, Sun Vault Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation and came out in 2017. So let's kind of start from the beginning. What is solar punk to you? Um, then I'll kind of say what's solar punk to me. And how did this book uh, come about? Yeah, and thanks so much for having me, Joey. I'm excited to just be talking about solar punk. Um, one of the things I think that, that's unique about solar punk is that everyone, as it becomes more popular and we and more people try to define it, I feel like everyone has a different definition of what solar punk is. So yeah. I'm curious to see if our definitions will match up at all or not. And I actually think that's really great. I'm sure some people think there should be a general definition of solar punk, but to me, that means everyone's taking what they need from it and adapting it to what their community needs or their individual needs, which I think yeah. is perfect and what it should be. Um, but yeah, so solar punk to me um, is a genre of literature, but it's also a way of thinking and viewing the world and also like a lifestyle choice, um, though primarily a lot of people still see it as literature. Um, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But um, one of the things I would love for solar punk to continue to do is grow into grow beyond the page and become something that we can use practically. Um, but yeah, my definition, my vision for solar punk kind of has three parts. So I see solar punk literature as a way to imagine new futures in the shadow of and in opposition to environmental collapse. And then um, the solar punk literature works to create those futures on the page. Um, I think solar punk stories must recognize the climate crisis and environmental collapse as entangled issues that include all oppressive systems. Um, And then finally, that there is no environmental justice without racial or decolonial justice. Um, So that's kind of where I'm, how I'm thinking about solar punk right now. Um, And, uh, and, and should I go on with how this book came about or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll just, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. So then, so for the book, um, Bronte, my co-editor, Bronte Whelan and I, we were both in an MFA program together for creative writing and environment. And um, uh, so um, we had, we were just starting to think that we wanted to do some sort of project together um, and sort of settled on an anthology. Um, and the reason we chose solar punk is we were um, frustrated with a lot of the sort of dystopian stories that we were seeing. Not that dystopians are, dystopian stories are bad, but there was definitely particularly in 2015, when we started putting the proposal for the project together, 
there was like a lot of dystopias that were coming out right around that time period. Um, and so we were kind of in reaction to that. Um, and we, I came across solar punk on Tumblr where a lot of people came across it um, and was really struck by the fact that it was recognized the like the impending and like happening aspects of climate change and that things were like bad. Um, but at the same time, it didn't just go into dystopia. It was like more, it leaned in the hopeful direction and tried to say, hey, how, let's, how do we reimagine this world as surviving and thriving during climate change rather than devolving into a dystopia? Um, and I was also struck by the fact that it did include social justice issues. So it wasn't just environmental, which is something that environmental literature I think often struggles with. Um, and then also that it made room for not only science and technology, but also spirituality um, and spiritual practice, which I think is really important, particularly when we start to move away from Western ways of viewing the world, which do obviously come with a harmful, very often harmful Christian religion, not always, but often. Um, and then when we start to look at indigenous practice, spirituality is so important to that. So we can't just you know, get rid of all spirituality. Like that's not gonna, that's not helpful either. So that was where some things that really drew me to, to solar punk. Um, and then um, Bronte and I were really interested in helping to try and jumpstart um, one of the, you know, quote unquote punk genres. And we put the proposal together and things just kind of fell together from there. And I am just like really pleased to see that the book is still being read and that it did, it does seem to still be impacting people, um, which is the most you could possibly want is that, someone would still be reading the book, you know, years down the line. So yeah, that's kind of how it came to be. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I genuinely I'm, I'm, I haven't finished it, but like I'm reading basically like different stories at a time. And uh, for me, so, solo punk is kind of just like something that I've been searching that I didn't actually know, I didn't have a name for in, in some ways. I, I read a lot of books, a lot of fantasy, a lot of sci-fi, and I do enjoy them, even like the dystopian and all of that stuff. There are some pretty good ones. But it, as you said, like it always felt like there was just something really missing. Uh, and same for movies, especially with movies, I suppose, because that's that's kind of the imagery that we keep in mind. And at some point, I just got really, really tired of the genre being kind of the go-to of anything that's in set in the future. Like almost anything set in the future is basically bad. Like it's basically not just bad. I mean, because things might be bad. You know, like the the reality or the possibility that the future might be bad. In itself isn't the problem. Obviously, I don't want I don't want people to kind of conflate solar punk with just being naive and kind of hoping for the best and not kind of thinking of things through. As but because as you said, um, like a significant component of it is actually recognizing the the, the dangers and the ongoing, the happening and and the forthcoming, uh, potentially forthcoming dangers of of like uh, climate change. And solar punk started for me also like mostly just like an aesthetic thing, just visual stuff. And it's pretty recent, like it's just in the past few months and, you know, really past year or so uh, in my case. Um, and it was like Tumblr, Reddit, some some just mostly like pictures of like the nice architecture and picture of like, you know, gardening in certain urban spaces. And sometimes it, it didn't, I didn't know what the difference between solar punk and just like really cool permaculture would be. You know, it, there was this kind of vagueness to it uh, in the beginning. But then the more I kind of got into it, and obviously that's where the, the literary aspect came in, in at least in, in my case, it's when I started seeing, well, now I can look at solar punk as one way, it's not the only way, but like one way of thinking about climate change. And it's really the, like the very act of thinking about climate change. I just took a course. It was like, think we must. And that at, at the, my university, it was really about the difficulties of thinking about climate change, like this literal act of thinking about climate change. And solar punk allowed me to kind of do that a bit more, and so yeah, that's that's kind of like the my my kind of uh, my two pieces on that in in the book. So I don't know if we'll you can by the way feel free to kind of talk about specific stories if you want, mm -hmm. but I'll mostly focus on like the the theme in general. Mm -hmm. um, in in the intro uh, of the book, you mentioned I have the quote here like the way we believe in the future is intrinsic to the fabric of our storytelling. End quote. Okay, so. You mentioned it a bit, but kind of let's let's flesh it out a bit more. Like, what's been wrong with storytelling, broadly speaking? That's kind of a huge umbrella here about the future uh, so far, in your view. Yeah, and that's such a great question um, to think about the future of storytelling because that's what I've been really wrestling with this a lot. Um, and I'm gonna root this very much in like the U.S. production of like storytelling and literature. Um, because that's what I'm most familiar with. 
Um, but I think one of the problems when we're thinking about storytelling for the future is that here in the US, much of the broad, widely available storytelling um, about the future is written and created by white men with a focus on the global north, um, rooted in this idea of progress, that capitalism is the way to go, and that um, and that we're going to keep moving forward um, as a as like as the quote unquote human species and we'll solve climate change and we'll solve all this stuff somehow. Um, and so I think that is like, that's just been so much of who has controlled our storytelling um, for like solid, for like quite a while here in the US. Um, and that's what's broadly available to the population. Now, obviously there's like whole literary movements that push against this. Like it's not, it's not the, it's, there's definitely a lot of diversity in what's available and we're definitely yeah. seeing a big change and what's available right now as just more storytellers are having access to like publication and to platforms that allow that aren't monitored by like, you know, big corporations, um, whether it's podcasting or like web shows, things like that. So there's definitely like different things. But um, one thing, but like a lot of what um, when we're thinking about like what storytelling is like, widely available as thinking about the future. I go back to uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe a lot just because here in the US, like one, I mean, I enjoy the movies as probably many people do, but especially in the US, like a huge portion of our population at this point has seen at least one Marvel film. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of times in the future, these stories are talking about climate change. They're referencing them um, in some way. So that's what our, what a portion of the general population has access to. Um, but at the same time, if you look at like, if you watch like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is one of the new shows, like definitely shows that like propaganda about the global North is why, you know, is alive and well and being shown broadly. Um, so in general, whether it's storytelling about the future or the past, I think we, I personally believe we need to start moving away more from the individual hero and protagonist and the singular journey with the rising climax and falling resolution um, for like lots of reasons, obviously, um, that's a very like westernized storytelling method that really supports capitalism, supports like the current sort of mode of thought, supports patriarchy, et cetera. So it's like rooted in some of these like oppressive systems that were um, that were that solar punk literature is hopefully actively pushing against. Um, but then too, I think there's no satisfying ending to the climate crisis right now. Like there's no satisfying resolution in sight in the way that our storytelling wants us to have a satisfying resolution. So right. then suddenly we have to start rethinking, how are we gonna do narrative? How are we gonna do storytelling? Um, and then with that question of course comes as well, like, is it gonna be traditionally published or traditionally made into a movie or is it going to, um, is it going to be disseminated in a different way? So I think um, sort of thinking about that is that where we need to start thinking about storytelling and decoupling it from these harmful systems. And first, I think just acknowledging that storytelling is like a tool of nationalism and has been. Um, and once we start to acknowledge that and we can start pulling it away from those systems and think, how can we use it to, um, to break down these systems rather than support them? Um, so that's kind of what I've been thinking about with when we were thinking about storytelling about the future. And um, how and how we can sort of start to move away from ideas of progress, especially. I think about that with science fiction a lot because so often we have progressed. We have left the planet. You know, human species has gone to war multiple times, but sometimes we're at peace now, and sometimes we're still fighting. But we have all this technology, and like there's still this idea that the progress is just going to keep going and going. Um, and that's something that I would really like to see examined in a different light um, because I think it is harmful at this point. You know, we need to start owning up to that as writers if we include that in our in our fiction. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the earliest uh, movies I can, I, I think anyway, it's one of the earliest in terms of like climate change related disaster movies like that, The Day After Tomorrow one. I was thinking about it recently and it's kind of, it kind of fits a pretty general pattern in a lot of similar movies. Like bad things happen, but kind of humanity comes together, although lots of people are going to die, that's too bad. And then towards the end, there's kind of like a resolution of some kind, like in, I think in The Day After Tomorrow, I mean, spoiler, sorry. But like, it's not a good movie, guys. Don't listen to it. <laughs> it's also watch. very old. I don't think you can yeah, do spoilers for it anymore. Fine. It's fine. Uh, but like, you know, the president comes and says that we've learned the lessons of Mother Nature's wrath or what have you. And essentially the idea is that, you know, climate change is going to punish us for about a week. And then um, we'll get over it. We'll learn from our lessons and we won't do bad things to the environment anymore. Like that's kind of the, the general pattern. Um, and I see this in a lot of, I mean, you mentioned the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For me, like Thanos as a character is fascinating because I feel like he exemplifies a lot of the current um, 
anxieties, let's say, about our world. Uh, and some people would actually say that he's not really the bad guy, even. You know, the, the, I've, I've, heard, I'm, I've heard the actor himself, whatever his name is, he said so. But anyway, um, but he, but Thanos is someone that you can beat, you know, you can murder, you can just kill him, that's it. And then problem solved. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, exactly. and you can just do this thing and you undo it, you get these infinity stones, you just click and that's it, problem solved. Uh, and you, even with that, you will have, of course, the hero arc in the end. I mean, spoilers, I guess, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that that is something that is... Um, uh, like it just got tiring. I really, really got tired. I, I have watched most of these films. I I would still from time to time go. Uh, I, I definitely don't think there's something inherently bad doing so. But they are, they, there's something like impoverishing about them uh, at some point. Like, I, I guess it's also like how, how many movies you watch or how many books of such you, you watch, uh, you read, sorry. So, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I started, I needed to find something that would help me navigate different um, anxieties about the future while at the same time knowing that these are works of fiction right like these are not i'm not reading a book and that says that in 50 or 100 years things are slightly better or what have you and knowing and thinking that this is what's going to happen but it's one way of at least trying to put myself in potentially or potentially better scenarios in the future with the intention or with the purpose that this then helps me in the present do something about it, if you see what I mean. Oh, for sure. And that's one reason why I think of, like I was thinking of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents books while you're talking about that, just because they are dystopias. They're generally considered dystopias. But at the same time, they give you all those tools. Like she has a sec, Butler has a section where she like, basically if you're reading it with that mindset, it, she teaches you how to pack your own bug out bag. And like, and it's just like amazing, like to do that in a piece of fiction and not feel like it's like expository and should have been cut, but that's like an important part of the book. And to give these survival tips while still telling an engaging story, that's still like this dystopia that's also like still scary to read. Um, and it's just like finding that balancing act is like one, I think just difficult from the point of view of a writer, but then also too, it's just like when it's done well, it's like so helpful. Here's like, I could go to this book and like pull things out that are like actually useful to read and like useful to me, my thinking about climate change and even potentially useful to my survival in a bad situation. No, for sure. And yeah. Okay. So just to go back to kind of the, the dystopians in general as, as a genre, right. Um, you just mentioned you just give an example of how they could also be good things you know it's not inherently a bad, a bad, a bad genre bad plot but why in your view anyway why do you think this dystopian post-apocalyptic uh genre these movies especially why do you think they've been popular in recent give or take few years or even past couple of decades to be honest yeah you know i like I've asked this question of myself a lot and I don't really have a satisfying answer yet. I mean, there's definitely plenty of like academic writers and like public intellectuals too that are thinking about this. Um, like Frederick Jameson's Archaeologies of the Future is a book that I, and that talks about utopias and dystopias. I think it's like really useful if someone wants to start digging into that. I think for me, I feel like it must be something to the effect that we want to know what the worst thing that could happen would be and what that and we and we like and knowing that somehow satisfies something within us um and but at the same time like i like find especially climate dystopia is very difficult to read like i don't go to them anymore um because i just like i like can't i have to i think about it i think about the climate crisis a lot just for my uh, my PhD, uh, my dissertation that I'm working on, articles that I'm working on, plus just thinking about solar punk and stuff. So like, I can't go read a dystopia for fun. <laughs> like, that's not where I go when I want to sit down and read a book that for in something enjoyable. Um, but I also think like, playing out the worst of what could possibly happen, whether it's the climate crisis, or it's a natural disaster, or it's um, social collapse. Um, I think that's one reason why we need solar punk, because we're not seeing it's interesting that we saw a rise in dystopias, but not a rise in utopias because they're, you know, say, you know, different sides of the same coin, right? But we're only seeing the rise in dystopia. So what I worry about is that we're like self-prophesying or like manifesting these worst case scenarios rather than thinking about, hey, let's acknowledge that things are bad, that, you know, things are gonna get bad and they are bad, um, particularly depending on where you live and your class and things like that. Um, but that it's, 
um, let's acknowledge this horror, but then let's do something about it. Let's not just like play out the worst case scenario. Let's figure out, hey, what is an alternate scenario where maybe things, you know, don't get so bad that we can like actually act and like make a difference in. I think also dystopias, and you've already kind of mentioned this, they really feed into our like lone hero obsession too, particularly in Western literature. And I think that's another reason why they fit very much in, not only do they feed on our worst case scenario desire, but then also it's like, oh, here's someone that can fix it. You know, here's like usually a white man that can go and fix things. And so I think that also just feeds into the type of stories that we're telling right now, which is another reason we're seeing like a lot of them. Um, and right now though, I feel like it's maybe gone back a little bit in the past year or two. We're seeing a little few less, but I know, especially in 2015, I just remember there's like a lot of them. Though interestingly enough, like I did read two dystopias recently that I think maybe show there's maybe going to be a little bit of a shift in dystopia and storytelling, which I was interested in. Um, it was Moon Over Crusted, Moon of the Crusted Snow by Wab Shug Rice and uh, A Children's Bible by Lydia Millette. And they both basically have the same premise, like, but they're from two very different communities, like the characters. Um, so that's basically like what happens when the grid goes down. Um, but in both these novels, while they're very dystopic and definitely have these very like fearful and horrifying moments, um, they end on these ideas of hope and they also have a lot of action. Like the characters are not just trying to survive the dystopia, they're like actively trying to create a community that can um, like thrive and help other people through the time. So it's not quite the same thing we saw in like the Mad Max movies. Um, so that was something I was interested in, particularly that ends on some hope. So I'm um, yeah, I'm just curious to see how how dystopias, particularly ones that are rooted in climate, um, start to maybe are maybe shifting or maybe not. Who knows? I'm very interested in you mentioned the the whole like lone the lo kind of like the lone wolf actor, lone for like hero. Because when we watch these movies uh like anything from like i am legend to i don't know whatever all, all of these other films we we don't see ourselves as the people dying we see ourselves as the hero you should like that's that's or as there's no point watching the movie like you don't you won't resonate with the character uh or at least that's part at least a big part of why they end up being popular and i think like the harm and i've started seeing this i, I can't obviously i can't make i can't prove it you know it's not something that uh, yeah, I, I just can't prove it, but I, I do think it's contributed to general uh, sense among many like family members, some friends, some people I know, even some people I read, that like they don't necessarily personally believe that they will be the ones dying in those movies, if you, if you kind of follow my thought here. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of the... And I don't want my answer to that be to be well. No, you can die. Like I don't want that to be my answer. Yeah. You know, like because that, um, I know that that's not helpful because you have all of these you know survival instincts that kick in and becomes more of like an emotional conversation, and we kind of kind of lose the plot of what, what we're trying to argue for. Um, but I do think it's so the way I'm, I'm describing it. I'm, I'm writing this essay. Uh, I think it should be out by the time this episode's out. I'm not sure. Uh, for Mongol Media. And one way I've tried to kind of argue for solo punk, essentially, it's kind of like my own, like, this is why I'm arguing for solo punk, uh, is that in the same way as it is very easy for, like, children in many places around the world to just imagine a zombie apocalypse, it's just super easy to do so. It's just everywhere around you. You don't need to even watch a movie. You just know about them just from hearsay and stuff, even maybe at kindergarten, whatever. I want it to be just as easy to think about solo punk futures. If mm -hmm. you see what I mean, and because then at least there's some kind of of like they have a different set of tools at their disposal, and I, I mean you mentioned Octavia, but I'm reading her book Kindred by the way now, which is oh, that's a great book. I haven't read the Parables yet. I will soon. Uh, it's been recommended like I think twelve times on this podcast alone. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, and Adrienne Mary Brown, I mean she has like a podcast on 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 Octavia Butler's Parables. But anyway, um. I know that there are the many people like Butler, like Brown, like others that have been trying to kind of think of like different futures that are also like actionable in the present, essentially, right? Would you say like, okay, this may be of a muddled question if that's okay, but I know that you mentioned like Solarpunk doesn't have a coherent definition. Everyone can see things, you know, differently and that's obviously fine, but would one of those, if there were kind of like a coherent definition, mean be that we're thinking about the future, knowing that we're doing something in the present, right? Like 
because we there are books about the future like that that wouldn't be the main thing that that differentiates solo punk in my view but i don't that's just me yeah and i think that's really i think that is an, an important part of solar punk and maybe in a way that differentiates it from other environmental literature um is is exactly that like one of the ways that Bronte Whelan and I sort of have formulated solar punk and sort of our sort of like call to action almost throughout a lot of our solar punk writing is this idea of hope through action. So this idea that we're the hope is the writing the stories of the future, right? That that's that's some of that hope. But then the action is what we're doing today to try and bring that future to pass or to make it viable or to just make sure that the next generation of like humans and non-humans have like a place to like not just survive but hopefully like thrive like have a place to, that's going to be a good place not, not what we're kind of setting ourselves up ourselves up for right now um so yeah that's kind of sort of how i think of it too is that it does have that duality to it but our actions in the present that are hopefully inspired from our stories of the future is um that's kind of what's motivating us to try and do better here even though of course and maybe we'll get into this later like individual action is not going to solve the climate crisis like at this point i don't think anything's going to solve the climate crisis like, i don't think there's a way to solve like solve it um but it's definitely not individual action so that's something that needs to be wrestled with as well but still there are things that you can do to change your relationship with the living world and like any step forward in that direction i think is always a positive thing that will impact the future whether it seems small like so small it wouldn't or not yeah yeah for sure uh and i mean you know just because you mentioned this now you you and and Bronte William have this upcoming book i think you know mm -hmm. and my life for the anthropocene and uh, you, uh, this is a quote, like, it's a book to engage with solar punk on a practical level. So that, like, that's fantastic. What, what does that, um, I mean, what can you tell us about it? What does that kind of look like in some ways? Yeah, so hopefully, um, we, just, we still don't have quite a release date yet, but I think it might, it's going to be coming out within the next year for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's another collection of work. This time it is coming out from an academic press. So that is like sort of one of the bigger differences and it's nonfiction. It's not necessarily leaning on fiction this time in hopes of pushing solar punk to kind of move itself off the page and into um, like the living or the, uh, the unwritten world or however you want to put it. Um, so yeah, what, what we were working towards is, and what it is is ultimately a collection of essays that encourage how we can take solar punk thinking and apply it to problems of today um, or problems that we're facing right now in the moment. Um, so like at the end of the book in our last section, we have um, four different like blueprints or recipes, we call them different things um, that kind of help people start to engage in small actions. So like whether it's like we have a really great essay on foraging um, and like it explains how to do it um, in a way that was really interesting. Um, but we also have an essay on like how to mend your clothes because that's something that particularly as a millennial, like I didn't really know how to do. <laughs> so just things like that, that is trying to pass this knowledge down to whoever would find it useful. Um, but then we also have some larger philosophical pieces that are thinking about how we can take um, sort of like environmental thinking and apply it like right now, like how can we do this? Like we have one one essay that's titled um, a guard, was it? a garden shed oh man i'm not gonna remember it's like tools in a garden shed um for solar punk futures something like something to that effect um and it just kind of gives you different ways of thinking about the world um so yeah that's kind of how we're trying to do it and we'll just see i'm really interested to see how the book is received because um i think it's like it is difficult to make that leap from fiction to reality um but at the same time i think that's something as storytellers that one people have done in the past this is nothing new um but then two um just putting value in um, in um, literature as a way to help us think forward through it. And you mentioned Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, and of course, one of the things I always go back to is her point that we're in an imagination battle. Um, and that's one of the things that um, I think solar punk can be really useful for, but then it can also start to move for towards inspiration for the now. Um, in a way that Adrienne Marie Brown, of course, um, her work with Octavia Butler does that very much, you know, wanting to take it off, not only have it on the page as inspiration, but then take it off the page just as something that is useful in the moment. One, one way that I kind of think solo punk can really benefit from essentially is kind of playing with words a lot. And I know that there's, uh, there's a video by, by St. Andrew, who uh, YouTube channel, YouTuber, uh, previous guest on this podcast that's episode 68 for those listening uh, and it's a book uh, sorry it's a it's a word called uh, perma blitzing and it's a contraction of permaculture obviously mm -hmm. uh, and blitz which is the German word for for like lightning and obviously most people I mean most people in Europe I suppose when they think of blitz they think of the blitz which is when the Nazis bombed uh, the UK 
but obviously the idea here is to actually use use a term that was used for death and actually use it for life. And so perma blitzing, I have one of the definitions here. Typ uh, quote typically create or develop a community or, or, or household edible wildlife friendly garden according to a permaculture design. Perma blitzes can also involve sustainable non food uh, non food growing projects. So it's not just food growing projects. Uh, end quote. And St. Andrew kind of, there's an excellent video, I'll link it in the description, um, kind of just explaining. It can be anything from just learning things, like going, uh, dedicating a specific time and space to uh, to learn about different, either anything from like first aid to like geology, to mycology, to what have you. And the idea is really the, um, or the driving force behind it in some ways is to emphasize speed and urgency in some ways, like to recognize that we are, uh, like we do need to do things a bit faster as well, or at least certain things, while at the same time doing it together. Like there is the community building aspect to it, obviously, because people can learn on their own. It's fine to learn. I, I'm, I, I tend to learn on my own as well. But obviously, in addition to that, it would be good to also have something that's more community uh, oriented. And this kind of goes back in some ways to we were talking about, like again, the, this whole lone wolf thing. One thing that some of the better, in my view, um, like dystopian or at least stories that are set in a dystopian future, uh, like some of those, the better ones, what something that they do is focus on how like a community comes together to do something. Well, often it's to kill off the zombies and to, <laughs> to do something, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that has an immediate resolution because that's, you know, more fun to shoot, I suppose. But, um, the, the impulse is for me at least better than just the lone wolf who will live off his life. And because one, okay, sorry. So because one thing that, um, I, I found very fascinating that a lot of those lone wolf stories, you know, and maybe I'm focusing on this a bit too much, but it is kind of a pretty common trope. Um, often the life that they lead can be more interesting than your life. Like, you know, like it, the world has, is dead. Things are miserable, but like interesting things are happening. And, if you're watching this for an hour and a half or two hours or what have you, you can come out, kind of come out of that um, movie not being as afraid of that dystopian apocalypse in some ways as maybe you should, if you see what I mean. Or at least should work to, to avoid it. <laughs> well, yeah, and something that strikes me from how you just described that too and thinking about, I hadn't heard of permablitzing. I'll definitely have to look that up because I think that's an important area that Solar Pump needs to move in too is taking what you know and be and sharing it and like sharing it with the community. But that's something I think about too with the lone wolf figure in dystopias, but also like there's definitely that figure in environmental literature as well, like whether it's like the tracker or the hunter. Um, and in both these situations, almost always they have the knowledge to survive. Um, and almost always someone comes along that doesn't have the knowledge to survive that ends up tagging along with this character in some form or fashion, right? And that's like kind of, that's part of that lone wolf trope because it wouldn't be any fun to watch a single person go through a landscape. We gotta have two people uh, minimum. So that's something I'm thinking about too is that when we have that lone wolf figure, they're not sharing their knowledge with the community. Like their knowledge is all like situated inside of them. Um, and that's something actually that like Wendell Berry um, talks about too, is how we have this older generation of people that do have a different relationship with the land just because of their time period being so different when like, you know, plastics weren't as readily available, just things like that. Um, and how like that knowledge is soon going to be all lost um, just as the population ages. And so thinking about how we can take that knowledge and share it, whether it's the, you know, the person who does have a lot of like, like that lone wolf figure that has that knowledge, or whether it's an individual who might have found themselves in a community that doesn't have something that they might find common knowledge. Um, and that's something that kind of going back to the idea of permanent blitzing that I hope that's what we talked about in the book and really emphasize in the book. That I think solar punk, people who are interested in solar punk literature, identify as solar punk, something that they can really do is either get that knowledge if they have access to it, like taking first aid classes, I think was a great example. That's something that's been on my to-do list for like a while now, because that's something that knowledge that needs to be readily available and be able to be shared. Yeah. Um, so doing that, or if they have something like at the end of the book and the conclusion, rather than sort of summing up our thoughts, um, what we did was we explained how to go about making your own anthology or collection and sort of the steps to do that, because that's one way to disseminate knowledge. And that was a piece of knowledge we felt we could share air in hopes of more people disseminating that knowledge and more people making anthologies or collections that will help spread knowledge um, throughout the community. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important thing is taking your individual knowledge and then plugging it into a community, whether it's an online community or even more preferably, of course, the physical community that you're in, if that's like a safe space for you to be a part of, like that's going to be your survival community if something does go bad, you know? So that was just, um, so yeah, just kind of thinking about that and thinking about how we can move from that lone wolf figure that has the knowledge to a community that has the knowledge. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? Yeah. Right. And also, like, uh, I didn't mention this, but I feel, I mean, I think studies have borne this out by now, but like there is a, a, a perception uh, that's usually widespread that when things go bad, um, people don't come together. Uh, and we've seen a lot, like from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina to a lot of even like recently, you know, Mm-hmm. There, there are tools that people use to just come together. They may call it mutual aid. They may not call it mutual. Like they may not have that kind of of vocabulary, and it doesn't really matter. Um, for me, solo punk contributes to kind of weakening that dystopian instinct, if that makes sense. Um, because a lot of, and here I'm, I'm sort of using a, a term that uh, I forgot who who spoke about it, but you know the entire figure of like Homo economicus of being basically, you know, usually a male figure, but, you know, they don't, don't always say this uh, out loud, but, you know, a rational actor who can just mm-hmm. make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. It's obviously always an individual. It's not part of, he, he usually it's a he. Mm-hmm. It's not part of, of kind of a wider community, whereas what we see time and time again, and again, I, I'm happy to find those links and put them in the description for listeners. Um, communities actually do much better. Like community resiliency is so much more efficient even than individual resiliency as you said like in most of those movies if the lone wolf spent some time with his magic knowledge or special knowledge to just educate some people or just share that knowledge with like five other people ten other people well maybe you won't need a lone wolf in that plot if you see what i mean but yeah sorry i just wanted to add that well yeah and i've been thinking about that pretty recently too in a slightly different way almost always in those stories too, like the men with guns, that's what I call it in my head, the men with guns, like show up at some point. And I'm just like, I've just been thinking like, one that doesn't have, we haven't seen that happen in the way that it's depicted. Like usually the men with guns that show up as the government and like, in like a bad way. It's not just people from your community that had guns that suddenly band together and show up. Like that's not who's showing up with the guns. Um, And so like, I just wonder like, like as storytellers, like, how, why do we keep including that in our storytelling when I don't think that's, I, I hope that that's not going to happen. And I don't like, I don't think it would to the degree that we oftentimes include it. And so I'm just like, that's just something I've been thinking about too, is that trope. And like, why do we include it? What, where is that fear coming from? And like, what's put that, what's put that fear in our storytelling? And like, why are we, why, why should we continue that? Why can't we move away from that trope? Because like, regardless of whether it would happen or happen or not, it just doesn't seem like that's a helpful trope to keep continuing, you know? So this is really random, but I've been thinking about something similar recently because I, so I had this conversation with a Bosnian academic uh, called Ida Hozic, and she sort of analyzed how a lot of what we call, and this is more like in the, like international politics mm-hmm. world, how a lot of the, what we usually call international relations or like a lot of, uh, political science kind of rests on the assumption that violence only equals this one thing mm-hmm. and men with guns. She actually used that same term as well. Um, and that basically a resolution to a quote unquote conflict basically simply means that the men have stopped shooting one another. That's effectively mm-hmm. what it means. Even if the structure like in, obviously I'm from Lebanon and the case, the, the po- what we call post-war it resembles a lot of the actual war because the same men eventually are, are in power. And I won't get mm-hmm. too much into it because I go, I go into this in the other episodes. But my point is that the sort of the framework of um, men with guns, as you, let's just use that term, that sentence now, is is pretty widespread beyond, I mean, you're in the US, so I, you know, mm-hmm. the, even this more than I do, but it's pretty widespread beyond just even a trope in media, a trope in literature, a trope in like the arts in general. It's even kind of seeped into our international governmental models, if you see what I mean. A lot of uh, even, okay, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into this. I don't get too much into uh, off the rails here, but it's something that I feel uh, solo punk actually, and here, this is pretty, um, you know, kind of like this is just me thinking out loud. It's kind of in draft mode. Um, but solo punk can even benefit in many ways thinking differently about things that 
like even international relations things like even um like diplomacy and all of those those terms because they usually also follow a pretty rigid one way of doing things most of the time that has been changing recently although not yet in the in the sense that it can make much of a difference on the ground but there are lots of people including like Idaho Zich, as i mentioned that have been thinking about this like she literally analyzes how uh ethnic peacekeeping or peace sharing agreements are highly patriarchal structures uh, because the ethnicities are usually male dominated, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so like just to say kind of to, to kind of complement what you're saying that even the, this whole trope, uh, which kind of like is a patriarchal approach is translated throughout our world, like in multiple fields from economics to politics to what have you. And it's definitely something that I feel um, Solopon can contribute to in one way, maybe not the only thing, but, you know, in one way to 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 challenging that that narrative, if that makes oh, sense. I, hope, sure. I like, hope that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it definitely does. And I mean, like, that's that's just the hope is that that's something that I noticed when we did Sun Vault, when we were doing when we were reading the submissions is that we would like we would have loved for a story to come in that challenged that like we would have that would have been our absolute like, you know, joy to have something like that. And I think sometimes solar punk, I don't know if it's be, or at least in this, I think it's changing. I don't think this is where solar punk is right now, but when we were working on that collection, especially it was a very like food oriented in a, in a way, like there was a lot of garden stories, which there's nothing wrong with writing a garden story. But at the same time, I was like, we go, we're, we're beyond this. Like we gotta be thinking, we gotta be thinking differently in a, in a larger way. Um, in like, so I, I think we have I think we have at least one garden story, like the, what I term the garden story, like that's focusing on how do we get food for a situation and like something has gone wrong with our food production in our community. How do we solve it? Um, which I think just speaks to the fact that that's something that um, people are a little bit more knowledgeable about. I have a feeling that's where that comes from. Um, and in the US, of course, we have a national literature that's based in thinking about like food, like growing food in the West and like going growing food throughout drought. And so that's very much part of our national literature. So like, I think that's one of the reasons certain stories were coming to us. Um, but yeah, that's something that I hope that solar punk continues to go in that direction to like get to think bigger and to think through some of these dominating storytelling structures. Um, in addition to thinking about on the small community level, whether it's a garden or a water source or a protest or something like that, like thinking on that small scale, but also on the large scale. So yeah, I really hope that solar punk, that there's a writer out there um, that will write that story. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, in one way also like also to compliment what you were just saying, it just for me it re-emphasizes that our dominant, for lack of a better term, I kind of struggle always to define the vague ideologies that we deal with. I mean, obviously capitalism, none of that, that they are also ideologies, like right, to actually name them as such. And mm -hmm. what, once you give them a name, then you kind of get, get you mentioned Frederick Jameson, I mean, the whole like it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Yep. It's one way of actually making it easier to imagine the end of capitalism than exactly. the end of the world. And and this is one way for me that I, I'm still, as I said, kind of in draft mode. I would hope that the more kind of we push this, these conversations happen, the more like people listening to this, one thing that I will always try and emphasize, like I literally mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that I got into solar punk like a few months ago. Uh, and this is the second or third episodes on solar punk. And I just, I'm reading all of these books and it's very easy to get into. You don't have to know anything. Just Google it, you know, play with mm -hmm. play with the term, go on YouTube, do what have you. I've watched a lot of YouTube videos of people saying what they think solar punk is. Sometimes I feel like, well, it's a bit of that, maybe a bit more. And I feel like, oh, you could have taken this a bit further, you know, but basically what I'm saying is that listeners can easily just get into, into it. There's no, you know, it's pretty vague on purpose in some, in some sense. Another sort of um difficulty that i've been having and this may not be directly related to what we're talking about i just want to kind of put it out there um a lot of the the attention economy that we live in today you know social media and the likes it relies on very quick sort of um you know feedback loops and so on all of those buzzwords now that i i think most people know about i'll try and do an episode on this specific uh, on its own i mean at some point and for me, solar punk allows me to also get out of that in some ways. Uh, I mean, I, I have it's not an anti-internet uh, statement here. I've I've only discovered solar punk through mm -hmm. the internet in the first place, and I'm not inherently anti-technology, but I do think some kind of skepticism is obviously warranted. And solar punk allows me to sort of find the balance between those two. Like, in which cases would it make sense to develop this kind of technology? In which cases would it make sense to just not? <laughs> and like it just doesn't make sense to do so and 
I suppose my my difficulty with uh, talking about solar pump, at least for now, uh, it's something I'm basically just thinking about out loud as well now, is when I enter that term, like I literally go on social media and I write solar, solar pump and I want to tweet about it or share or write or what have you. A lot of the time I, sorry, this is going to be a bit of a vague thought, but a lot of the time I I worry that it doesn't necessarily lead to just more people hearing about it. Oh, sorry. That it doesn't necessarily lead to more people actually then kind of logging off, so to speak, and then reading a book or a blog post or just checking it out or what have you. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that SolarPunk is also, it, it's coming out of like from the internet in a specific attention economy world that we live in right now. And I do wonder what would it take and I suppose a book like yours is basically the answer. So to get it off just those very quick feedback loops, if that makes sense. I'm sorry. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, it totally does. And that's something too, that I don't know when we, when we were, st- when we originally kind of found the solar punk term, it did excite me because I think when you hear it, it kind of like, there's like an intuitive sense that it makes. Like you're like, ah, yes, I have a sense of what this will be about just from hearing the word. And, um, and I think and it sounds really nice. It just sounds cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it does. It just sounds good. And in a way that I think like cyberpunk actually also has that sort of like, Ooh, like I know what that is just, just from hearing it, but it also sounds really cool. So yeah, I think solar punk has that, um, has that sense to it, which I think is good in the sense of getting people to get that initial reaction. Um, and then, and, and like, hopefully, like, as you said, Google it or look in their local library to see if like, now there's a couple anthologies out that are slowly getting, that are getting more distribution, um, or, you know, order something from their bookstore, et cetera. Um, so I hope that that is enough. Um, but at the same time, like, I think this gets to a bigger, maybe issue that you kind of, um, touched on, which is like, is, is a book or a story, um, enough to really, to like, like is knowledge power? Like that was something that you mentioned earlier. Like, like, is that, is like, I think a lot of us, whether we were academics or writers or just readers really believe that and we want it to be true that if we get the right knowledge, that that will help us become better people and, and make a better world. And something that I think about is, and something that like I worry about too, is that I, as a, because I am first and foremost, like a fiction writer, you know, I really believe that there's power for a book to change the world, like a book, a story to change the world. But as we see excellent like climate like climate change fiction come out, we see excellent storytellers warning us, and they've been warning us for decades, you know, for in some cases a century that like the industrial revolution is going to play out badly, and the fact that we like you know we haven't made the change that we needed to make in order to to be in a different situation than we are right now, and there's not enough change on the horizon to suggest that things aren't going to get bad in the next fifty years. And so that really makes me question the power of storytelling in the mode that it's presented now, which is, you know, a best-selling book would be how we'd think of a story really being disseminated or a movie that, you know, makes a billion dollars. Um, and so sometimes I wonder, like, is that, is as a writer, like, maybe that's not the way that we're going to make a story that's going to change the world. Like, maybe that's not how it's going to get disseminated. And what does that even mean? Like, does changing our community, is that is that the world we should be focusing on, the smaller community that we're a part of? Um, because if you wrote a book that changed the world, every community is different and what they're going to need during the climate crisis is going to be different too. So there's not going to be a singular answer. There can't be a singular book anymore um, that's going to help like all the communities in the world. And I wonder how much of that goes back to our, this idea that, you know, we're going to solve the climate crisis or we're going to like solve like houselessness or hunger, et cetera. Um, which of course just then spirals all the way back to our Western ideas of thinking, trying to create a system that will solve all the world's ills. And like, that's obviously not going to happen. Um, so yeah, I guess I kind of spun out from where your question started, but just thinking about um, what I guess, like how, how are, how we're taught to view stories and how we're taught to view success. And also like what kind of story is like needed right now, excuse me, maybe the power of story is not on the world scale, but on a much smaller community scale. And what does that mean for us as storytellers or, or content creators or creators in general? No, for sure. I mean, that, that is definitely a difficult one. I, I, I tend to like storytelling is part of, it's part of the story. Like it's part of the, it's part of the tools that we have at our disposal. Obviously, it's, I mean, it's not going to solve social justice issues. Obviously it's just part of, of tools that are there. The way I kind of try and think about it is that it's a much needed, 
it's like it complements the work of climate scientists for example you know like mm -hmm. climate scientists are doing more than most of us can do it's a pretty difficult life already and i know a lot of climate scientists that are you know already dealing with a lot of of mental health issues due to what they know um and i guess for me uh, yeah I, I just think storytelling would be one way of 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 approaching that otherwise pretty vague problem at least for most people a pretty vague problem at the same time i also think that language in itself so i mentioned perma blitzing and you know one thing that I, I know that has become more common in the past year with the pandemic uh, is, you know, mutual aid. Mutual aid as, as a term has just become a bit more common. I just heard people that I know are not like anarchists or whatever. They just mm -hmm. have been using that term a bit more. And I do think this is it's one of the ways that we can uh, hack a culture, hacking in the original nicer term uh, definition than than some of the current definitions but anyway a way of just influencing uh or like mm -hmm. inserting a certain way of viewing things by actually uh, sorry influencing language which would then influence how we think about things and that's if we can find a way in my view if we can find a way to make terms like mutual aid solar punk uh, perma blitzing you know all of those things just more uh common just like it it stops becoming this um novelty right to too many people it's just something that's part of our vocabulary then maybe when things do happen when there's something bad when there's a certain event that might otherwise just be kind of relegated to oh this is too complicated for us to think about then we at least will have like these extra tools at our disposal to try and make like it may not always work but to try and make some better sense out of it if that makes sense Oh, for sure. And that's something like as as a solar punk I've been thinking about too, is like, is the power of language. Um, and and I think it can go the reverse way too. So we, there's definitely words that I think we need to inject into our vocabulary that will, I think, help like just make people stop and think differently. Um, like uh, like slow violence by Rob Nixon, like that term is something that I think is such a powerful phrase because it makes sense when you start thinking about climate change, particularly I think if you've lived through a climate event, like you know the violence doesn't stop after like the news cameras stop, like you, it makes the sense to it that I think can help us rethink, like think through the world. Um, but I think too, it goes the other way too about removing language, like words from our language um, and thinking about the certain words that um, particularly colonizers have like have injected into um, a language. I'm thinking particularly in English. Um, and so like, I, so like ableist language is one that I think is everyone can start to work on just getting rid of. Um, and it takes a lot of thought and you do have to repro your brain because we say a lot of these words just haphazardly. Um, but once you start to reprogram your brain, like that has a lot of like, that has an extension of how you think about your community. Like, you know, if you're not using derogatory language. Um, but then also there's this excellent essay by Robin Wall Kimmer um, called Learning the Grammar of Animacy. And it talks about, it basically gives you a sense of how to see how language helps you see the world differently um, and see, see the, like the living world as alive. So like some of it is just about sort of what we think of as non-human and human. That's part of the essay, but it goes a lot more, it goes a lot deeper than that. And I just, I always recommend people read that essay. Um, because it's like just really encourage you to change how you think through the language that you use and how powerful that can be and how that like capitalist systems have really like injected certain ways that we think about profit into our English language and how that does change it. Like an easy one, of course, that probably many people that listen to this podcast have thought of is that we say we spend time together. But like, why do we use a word that is like has that profitness to it, like spending that has a monetary value to it when we're like, in community with each other like um so yeah i'm sure like i said sure people that listen to this podcast think about that but um i think it goes both ways like thinking about new words to help us understand the world but also changing the way that we use the words we already have no for sure i, I will by the way i would link all of what we're talking about in the description um you you also write in here I'm like i'm quoting you and i know some people don't like being quoted at i don't like when they do that but i'll, I'll do it anyway <laughs> Uh, you write, and I quote, we're more afraid of losing what we want in the short term than facing dangerous obstacles in the distance. These are failings of culture, not of science, end quote. So as it happens, so we're recording this like uh, Monday, June 21st, about a week ago, there was a vote in Switzerland on essentially just taxing CO2, like this whole pull it to pay principle kind of thing. And, I mean, the law had its flaws. Uh, I would be among those that says that it didn't actually go far enough and so on and so forth. 
but it actually failed. Uh, most people voted not to even have that that tax. And I had a conversation with, um, I won't name any names. The answer that I got, or kind of the impression I got out of that conversation is just a sense of helplessness, actually. Not not ne necessarily from them, but like I was feeling helpless on their behalf because it was such a cynical way of seeing, seeing things that like basically it doesn't make any difference whether we do things now or later. Basically, that was the quote unquote argument. And for me, this is a failure of part of the imagination, a failure of imagination, because it actually assumes that we will have time later to think about it if we don't think about it now, right? And this is kind of a, it's a, it's a tricky, um, it's kind of, it's a difficult line to walk on because at the same time, you're kind of going back to what you said earlier, I don't want my answer to just say, well, no, later you won't have any time. Like, you know, I don't want that to be my only answer, obviously. Although, because at this, on two, like, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, because on one hand, it is, it is important that we do things now rather than later. Like, we know this for a fact. At the same time, if we don't do something now, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to be done later. And it's a very, very tricky, um, you know, balance to maintain, because especially the later part of it, you just don't know. And so you can't make that argument, like, out of certainty, if you see what I mean. So, kind of, to go back to your quote... <sighs> What do you think these failures of cultures represent? If that can I just explain that quote to us, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's a difficult quote too because I was reading, you know, having I haven't read the introduction to Sunval in like probably a few years at this point, um, and I don't know if we would write that now. Like, I'm not sure if we would. Um, mainly not because it's not necessarily like quote unquote like true, but at this point, as more as more research comes out about what is causing the climate, like causing the climate crisis, like um, on, a, on a sort of like a scientific level, like obviously like there's a lot of big ideolog ideological issues that are like part of this, but it's very clear that it's not like the, it's not the average person um, like that's just yeah. like living their yeah. life. It's not the, it's not just the average individual. It's this very, very high percentage of, um, of, billionaires usually and like these well these very wealthy people that are are responsible wealthy people and corporations and also like the global north like definitely is part of that too like a large portion of that as well so in that sense you know um i feel like particularly white people in the u.s um you know speaking from my own position do have something they need to be thinking about when it comes to this um but at the same time um like, I don't think we can put it on the individual whether it's like a vote or um or um, something like recycling is, of course, the one that a lot of people think about and do. Yeah. And like, yes, you should recycle because it changes your relationship with things and with the living world and you're thinking about your consumption, et cetera, et cetera. But you, I don't think you should do it because you think you're going to solve climate, the climate crisis. That's not what it's going to do. Um, so, yeah, like that's something that we've been thinking a lot about in the new book, um, because it is easy to write sentences like that. But then also you have to like wrestle with that fact that it's, it's such a small percentage of people that are sort of responsible for the situation we're in right now. Um, in addition to also that sometimes can put using we in that sense, like we're afraid of losing what we want in the short term. That also lumps in a lot of indigenous people that are not responsible at all for what is going on right now, you know, that they were, you know, have been trying to warn us for well, a very long time. Um, so I think that's something. So yeah, that's just some of my thoughts on like that quote and how thing, how we might look at it differently now. Um, but at the same time, I do think it is a failure of culture in the sense that our culture, particularly speaking of like Western culture and a culture in the US is a culture of individualism. It's a culture of you have to work hard enough to get what you want. And if the other person has less than you, that means they didn't work hard enough. Um, and, and a sense of like sort of there is a sense of like there is community, but at the same time, particularly like in like um, there is also a sense of like certain people having there's class, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There's also a lot of class separation that comes within like there's community here, but there's also like the class separation is getting so wide in the US that it's like undermining any sense of community. Um, and so so, yeah, I think that also comes back to um, to that idea that in our the culture that's being that's being like put out to us is a very harmful culture and not one that's going to help us with the climate crisis and we saw this in the pandemic particularly in the US where you know people refuse to wear masks you know because i because they couldn't breathe or whatever like you know they had these ridiculous reasons for it 
And it was it was an individual choice rather than a community choice. And I think the people that do wear that did wear masks and continue to wear masks where it's where it's a place of safety for their neighbors are thinking about that exactly. They're thinking about their neighbors and their community and people that they might not know but have, but come in contact with anyways. So yeah, like we can see how our culture is already actively causing people to die in a very, very open way in the US. And that's the culture that's still being fed and like still being taught and still being put out. Um, so in that sense, I do think it's a cultural failing, but I do, I do hesitate to referring back to the quote to see that we as an individual thing as like a, we're like you and I are facing this. Like, I think that can be a, a tricky statement and something that um, we need to be very careful when we're using that language. No, for sure, for sure. Um, and hope, like I hope it didn't also sound like I was necessarily blaming that relative. It's more, it's like I think also specifically from Switzerland. So Switzerland is a space, pretty specific country. There actually the impacts of uh, uh, heat, like climate change, is I forgot what the statistics are, but it's happening even faster just due to to the geography of the location and Oof. there's just, there's just a lot of of issues surrounding that. But you know, like I mean, you mentioned the pandemic it's just inevitable that we kind of bring it up in some way or another because i do also wonder and you know this is one of those things that i'm saying out loud that I, I also wonder what 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 i'll think of when i listen to this in like 10 years or whatever but the changes that it is unfortunately imposing on on many of us a lot of what um the, the, like a lot of people essentially it's also driven by like media and politics and so on, just want to go back to normal. And usually there's this go back, you know, there's this emphasis on just let's go back to, basically let's just go back to 2019, pretend 2020, 2021 hasn't happened. And, you know, well, hopefully things will be better back then. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, for me, this is a failure of the imagination, kind of broadly speaking, right? I, it's not on any individuals. It's just something that like, if, you, if you're kind of taking this eagle-eyed, view and you say oh well something is wrong there this feels like well this this seems to be to me anyway it seems to be one of the flaws there right like we are having difficulties thinkings thinking sorry of different ways of being right again this whole like mm -hmm. easier ima easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism and this is this is what i saw in that relative this is the sort of the thing is that's why i didn't blame her personally i didn't blame them actually it was more people but i don't blame anyone i, I try not to blame as much as i can mm -hmm. anyway but it's just something that i just see it manifested you know it starts or at least the, the biggest responsibility is definitely at the top with the corporations all of these things we know this for a fact by now uh but then it's also like how how does this kind of um percolate into our own societies into our own cultures because at the end of the day we live in that same world that's been created by 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 these uh, power structures and solar punk for me has a way or could have a way like has that potential right to challenge to undermine this kind of rigidity this kind of of um uh what's the term i'm looking for like ideological hegemony if that's not too academic -y. and i do wonder like from your viewpoint if, if that's okay like you mentioned the the, the the book that will hopefully come out like next year or whatever how did you kind of went how did you sort of go from um basically how do you go from like solar punk fiction to solar punk non-fiction because that's not an easy thing to do yeah no it's not and um i think one of the part of what we did it did involve a lot of writing on our part the book's kind of unique in that sense when it comes to a collection usually an academic collection We'll have maybe one piece by the editors um, and then it'll be the rest will be by contributors, but we actually included quite a bit that was written by us. Um, because we knew we needed to make that transition and we knew that transition from fiction and nonfiction would not be easy and felt like we needed a, a guiding hand in that sense. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of writing to kind of write us there and I think what it is was recognizing um, the the pot like recognizing the possibility in solar punk as a, as an ideology or as a as a way of seeing the world doesn't just have to be like fictional and mainly because the stories um particularly some of the ones that i really enjoy are happening in like a very near future um they're definitely solar punk stories that happen um in a farther future there are ones that are more fantasy based um and those are all very viable and very important like there's definitely a lot to learn in those stories as well um but some of the stories that really stick out to me from like sunvault like boston hearth project is a story that um i oftentimes point out as a good example 
of, of solar punk because it takes technology and it takes the climate crisis, but it focuses in on a community and what a community needs. And so that's where I really see solar punk jumping from fiction to nonfiction is starting to think about the community a person is in and what that community needs, um, particularly when we start to think about um, what might happen um, as the climate crisis continues to worsen. Um, and obviously that's very difficult to try and imagine, but that's where solar punk fiction can come into play is thinking through what might happen to this community that I'm a part of. How can I help prepare myself or have a space prepared or even just like make sure I know my neighbors. Like that's a big thing that I think um, we can always make sure and do. Um, and like, what do they have resources that would be helpful? Do I have resources that could help them? Do they have like, if something were to go bad and we needed to leave, do they have medical issues that maybe we need to be aware of? Um, or do they have like, you know, like how do I make sure every part of the family can like escape or get out or whatever? Um, and I'm thinking, the way the reason I'm using these words like escape and get out is because I just came from living three years in Reno, Nevada, um, and thinking about the drought there that's currently happening on the West Coast. Like the wildfire season is going to be really, really bad this year. Um, I don't think there's any way around it. And so thinking, so sometimes that's literally what you're doing. You're getting your stuff and you're leaving. Like there's no time. Um, so that's why I'm using sort of these these words like escape. Um, so. Um, so yeah, I think that's one place that solar punk can really jump off the page is that someone who identifies as a solar punk or as a writer of solar punk fiction can look around at their community and say, what can, what, what can I do to help this community thrive um, if things, as things get worse? Um, and also thinking about your, what the climate crisis might look like in your community. Like it's going to look very different for me in Williamsport, Pennsylvania than it will for you. Um, and like knowing and learning that um, what the living world is going through is also part of that too. So it's sort of just having this practice, like trying to find this practical knowledge that many of us don't necessarily have, particularly if we're not living in the place that maybe we grew up in, um, or if we lived in a place where, or we moved around a lot, or there's just a lot of different reasons. Um, but finding that knowledge, finding that community, and then being able to like look forward and say what might happen, like what bad things might happen and like how do I like work to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but also too, I just wanna add like a quick caveat to that as well. Um, sometimes too, um, I think we all need to make sure that we, uh, especially if we're new to a community or maybe are just becoming more active in a community that we take time to make sure and listen and to make sure particularly to people that um, to elders in the community or people if there are people of color in the community, um, indigenous people in the community, like don't just hop in because you think you know, you, you know, you have this vision of the future and you have ideas. Um, sometimes that'll be the right move and sometimes it won't be. Um, and so sometimes just making sure to be like, like, thinking through your actions and being, you know, open-minded and also making sure to be quiet and listen at times too, I think is also very important um, to making that transition from fiction where we can be more lively on the page to solar punk as like a lifestyle and as nonfiction, just making sure to listen to the other voices that are around and to not necessarily see solar punk as a win all be all ideology. Like this is, this is not, that's not what it's supposed to be. That's not what it's going to be. It might be something that's helpful for you and your community. And then like, that's what, that's what it will be. No, for sure. Really, I, I just, I think it's best to see it as one tool among among others, basically. Exactly. And, and I think like I, something I I have tried to, like I've tried to become, to be a bit better on this uh, recently because I was pretty bad at it. Of like, I, I would be very intense about climate change with friends and family. Like I would just be a super intense person. And uh, most of the time I just, they just block, <laughs> they just block me. Yeah. Just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't achieve the goal that I think it does essentially. And so, one way that I've been experimenting and more recently, obviously, like following many other people's um, experiences is to start small often. Um, and small doesn't mean uh, inconsequential. It doesn't mean um, maybe even small is not the correct term. I don't know. But basically, it's like I'll, I'll tell them, well, get into it, but like pace yourself, do things, find your own pace, essentially. Uh, you will find like in my experience, like I will go through periods where I'm really doing a lot of it, like there's a huge concentration of it, but then there will be other periods where I really, I just can't and I need to kind of back off and like do something stupid or watch Netflix or just kind of, you know, anything really. And there is, for me, part of, of the effort in some ways is to help myself and help others who want uh, let go of the guilt that we have. Now, 
guilt can be useful if it's kind of a tricky situation i don't want people to, i don't want i don't want like the exact opposite either i don't want to just not care essentially because that's that's kind of the association that people might have but one thing that i've learned from reading way too many psychology books for my own good is that worrying essentially can feel like an action in itself right like it can really feel like if you're worrying you're doing something if you're not worrying you're just a monster and there is it's more complicated than that because worrying can actually be a false friend and can be just you end up feeling tired but you haven't done anything really you're just worried about it you're just worried about this thing and nothing came out of it now nothing has to come out of, like something doesn't have to come out of it i'm just saying that it feels like something did come out of it if that makes sense and for me again like solar punk is a way of kind of hacking that problem in some ways because we are thinking about the future short term uh even like the present even and it's it's a way of acknowledging reality while also trying to think of how reality could be different so it's just it's a recognition that we influence reality essentially yeah yeah and i love how you put that and i think that's one reason why people who sometimes who find solar punk they're like well this is naive and it's like no it's it's not naive like i think especially if you start reading solar punk fiction you would definitely see that it's not naive but at the same time, the whole point is not to, it's not dystopic. Like, I think that's like the thing is, you know, it's not dystopic. And I think um, whenever people say like, well, why is solar punk doesn't seem very punk? Like what's punk about it? One thing I always say is, well, solar punk should be fun. Like, um, I feel like I always, as, as is probably very obvious from my answers in this podcast, I have a tendency to lean very earnest and very like serious when I talk about these things, but I always try to come back and interject it with that. It's supposed to be fun. And like, you're supposed to be, I mean, there's a reason why people sing songs at protests and chant and dance and things that at a protest that might be something for a very horrific thing that's being protested, but you have to have that release. Um, and, and also it's very important. Like if we let um, this, if we let this, um, climate crisis steal our sense of fun and enjoyment then like we're looking at a different type of bleak future that we don't want to get in on so um, one thing I was recently talking to some students um, about writing solar punk fiction and I said if you haven't been to a punk show I know many of us haven't been able to do that because of the pandemic but definitely like go to a punk show at some point because they are like a ton of fun but there's also a lot of like emotion that's being released in addition to that very sort of like uplifting energy, um, whether it's anger or sadness or grief. Um, and I think that's a place that solar punk can, can function. Like you were saying, it can be a place where we can release that. Um, and that's one reason too, why in Sun Vault, we didn't just limit it to near future solar punk stories. I think it, you know, solar punk tends to lean a little bit towards the near future, but definitely does not have to. Um, and I think some of that is there's like a lot of fun to be had in imagining space travel and imagining what equitable space travel might look like um, and like environmentally friendly and sustainable like the space travel might look like. Um, and so there's a lot of room for just that um, wild imagination and just that, the fun that comes from writing science fiction and fantasy to um, move in solar punk as well. So yeah, like definitely like we can't let ourselves get bogged down in, in total earnestness and total um, like recognition of how, of like, of like how bad things could be. There's gotta be that enjoyment. There's gotta be that fun. Um, and I think that's one of the things that also comes from making sure that you're rooting your solar punk and your solar punk thinking in like community and not individualism. Cause um, you know, as soon as there is, uh, you know, once you come together as a community, there's a lot more space for laughter and for fun and for um, like, you know, dinners and food to be shared and, and the gift sort of gift giving to happen and things like that. And um, all of that comes together and comes alive with community in a way it can't necessarily with the individual. For sure. And like one way for me to think about it is like, it's the difference between gardening and community gardening, right? And gardening is fantastic. Even, even if you don't have the option to do community gardening and you're just gardening, that's mm -hmm. fine. Obviously I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Uh, but there is that kind of this added layer that gets added. Like you're also gardening, but you're gardening with others. And the entire point is really that there, there are different individuals essentially coming together to do this one thing or these many things. And usually, almost always, someone knows more than someone else. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to find, like, you know, you know as much about radishes as they know about potatoes or whatever, you know. There's always something to be exchanged. And that's actually that's actually the process. And for me, gardening is, like, at, I understand you mentioned, like, you know, you don't want too many gardening stories. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, fair enough, obviously. But for me, it is it is something that the more I see community gardening, uh, gar garden, sorry, the more I feel like there is some sense of community in that local, right? Like in that neighborhood, there's one next to where we live. Mm 
and it's part of the joy of living here to be honest uh i i, I do know that if something happens to that garden there would be a genuine mourning process essentially because obviously some some are not quote-unquote profitable obviously and so you have to create a rent, a rent creating mechanism and so you'll, you'll destroy those gardens and create some building and this is it ends up being an actual loss uh i have experiences back in lebanon so anyway yeah so it, on that note so like are there sort of things that you wanted to get into that we didn't really get into before we can then get into the book section no, I think we and we had a wonderfully wide ranging conversation, which was good. And I'm glad I, I did want to make sure to end on sort of a fun note, uh, to put it that way, because I think that is something that we need injected a lot more into um, think, or thinking about the climate crisis um, in general. It's just that there has to be humor. There has to be, you know, funny stories that get passed around. There has to be the, you know, the dancing at protests in addition to recognizing that you know things are are going to be might be bleak in the next 50 years um and so just making sure to find that balance um because like you even mentioned if you just if you're too if you go too hard on on talking about um climate change you usually alienate people um whether it's because the, the whether it's from fear or whether it's because it's hard to wrap our heads around what's going on on such a massive scale um but yeah so just making sure um you know to end on sort of that uplifting note that keep things fun you know um a punk show doesn't happen with just one person it happens with a bunch of people and uh to see what you can see what fun you can come up with um in your community um that isn't just thinking about how bad things could be that's not how a solar punk story ends well speaking of stories of things books anyway uh let's get into the book section well i love i know them in advance obviously so i love all of the, the three recommendations but what are, what are the three books that you would recommend and, and why yeah, so um, the first book that I have down is The Dispossessed um, by Ursula K. Le Guin, which I'm sure has been recommended before on this podcast. Um, and it's yeah, like four or five times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you read it? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, that's every that's how it goes with all books, right? You always have your to be read pile. Um, but yeah, The Dispossessed was is a it's a ambiguous utopia is what it's described as. But um, don't let the idea of it being utopia turn you off because it's so much more than that. Um, but it's uh, about a physicist who lives on an air, in an anarchist community. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's a very, it's a difficult book to describe um, for folks that read it. Hopefully you agree with that. But ultimately, it's a story of this anarchist community. And one of the things that is so, that was so like jaw dropping for me when I read it is that um, I did not go into the book thinking I would have any really interest in anarchy. I just thought it was an unrealistic system, like belief system. Any, any you know, I hadn't really met any anarchists at that point. Um, and so it was just a different point in my life. And then I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, like this, this is how we all should be living. Like this is the way to do it, you know? And um, so I think um, one of the things that's beautiful about that book is it makes anarchy look complicated, but it also makes it look doable. Like it answers a lot of the basic questions that you wouldn't expect a work of fiction to answer. Like who picks up the garbage, you know, cause no one wants to pick up the garbage, right? So how do we manage that? So it's a combination of a great story, some really great characters, but then world building that is really inspirational. Um, so that's why I recommend it to everyone. Um, it's also pretty short and it's just really good. Um, so yeah, that's the first one. Um, second book is nonfiction. It's Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, I imagine a lot of people at this point have heard her name tossed around quite a bit, um, but if you haven't read Emergent Strategy, definitely would recommend it just because I think it's a different way of looking at the world and a different system of sort of organizing life, livelihood, work, friends, that can be really useful. Um, it's not necessarily like, it's it's not something that's supposed to be like an environmental text, so she definitely talks about the environment a lot, um, but it's just a really useful book. And of course, there's a lot more um, works from her at this point. So yeah, I think that's a really good starting point though. She also... Um, Adrienne Marie Brown really knows how to have fun um, while talking about these serious topics, which I think is something that I know I always try to learn from, especially um, when it comes to her work. And then the final book, I actually referenced one of the essays from it earlier, is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer. Um, that's her essay collection. And um, all the essays are brilliant. I don't think you can read that collection and not be changed by the end of it, um, which is one reason I really recommend it to people, but especially learning the grammar of animacy um, is definitely a very um, important essay. Oh, yep. You got a copy of it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, sorry. Yeah, continue. Sorry. No, it's just that that's a book that I, those are all, those are three books that I definitely always try to push off on everyone that I meet. I'm like, I think this book will change your life in a good way. <laughs> so I recommended Robin's book on, on the class I mentioned before. Uh, so hopefully more people will read it. I actually mm -hmm. invited her on the podcast, but she was too busy. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll try and reinvite her at some point in the future. And I, I will hopefully get Adrian Marie Brown at some point as well. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I will I will link to a conversation that she had on the final scar, which is this this anarchist podcast that I also was on as a guest like some time ago. And it, it's a fantastic conversation. It was like around the, her latest book, which is like We Will Not Cancel Us. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, I, yeah, no, I will I strongly agree with your recommendations. <laughs> All right. Well, Phoebe, thanks a lot for your time. This has really been fun and, and productive and amazing and all of those other nice words. So yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah. And thank you so much, Joey. This was like, this was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. These times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com/slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.